Stairway to Freedom, Chapter 10, The Law of Mutual Attraction. We now turn to consider an aspect of the growth of mankind that is limited to progression through the spheres of consciousness. We enter an area that is somewhat nebulous when considered in relation to the more mundane considerations that were examined earlier. We wish to think about the forces that attract man to earth in the first instance and the forces that impel man on his journey through the planes that exist for exploration by man once again discarnate. Such consideration present concepts that will be quite difficult to explain and perhaps even more difficult to comprehend as they concern forces and events relatively unknown to normal thinking. We must, therefore, begin by explaining that the forces that play round and through any material object which is akin to gravity is but a low form of a much larger concept that has far-reaching effects upon all life. That enigmatic force that is termed gravity has properties that have been explored and quantified for many years without anyone beginning to understand what it is. As is so often the case, scientists remark upon the effects of gravity and how that effect grows or declines in relation to the mass of a body and the distance between two bodies, but have to content themselves to limit their investigations to that. The nature of gravity will not be easily understood as it relates to a fundamental law of like attracting like, the law of mutual attraction, which is, as are all laws, from God. If the laws of gravity are incomprehensible to man, you can imagine that to describe the law of mutual attraction in all its beauty and wonder will be an almost impossible task because language does not exist to describe some of the events occurring. However, let us assume that gravity is a force that exists within a body and radiates outwards from that body for a certain distance. It has been observed that the force is greater in a dense material and is termed mass. All that means, of course, is that some objects or materials have a greater amount of gravity within them than others. Thus, they are attracted to the surface of the earth more strongly and appear heavier. Lead is heavier than a feather, the force of gravity being greater in lead than in a feather. As to why any one object should appear to be heavier than another, scientists conclude that the atoms comprising that matter would be more tightly packed than in a lighter object. Therefore, the space between any two atoms would be less in a heavy object and greater in a light object. In fact, the space between the atoms is irrelevant, as is the weight of any atom. The force that is termed gravity bears no relation to the number of atoms in an object, nor how tightly they might be spaced. That theory is a futile attempt to account for the difference in mass between different materials and is incorrect. We will attempt to explain the nature of gravity which acts upon bodies and gives them mass. The power of God is a force that is, in essence, a life force and indeed creates all that is. That life force is capable of many variations in its manifestation. It is seen in all live creatures and equally is in all inanimate objects. Thus, as has been stated earlier, all is related and all is one. That life force can be considered to be at the heart of every atom and radiates outwards towards everything else.
It is a law of God that, in its drive to achieve oneness, it seeks to draw all matter to itself. However, it would be nonsensical if matter combined in a haphazard fashion. Therefore, the archangelic forces that control the life process endow matter with certain characteristics that permit order to obtain. In the case of material objects, it was found relevant to endow atoms of earthly matter with an attractive force varying in strength from slight to great. This has enabled matter to combine into patterns that we see around us. The atomic particles that combine to make the structure of a bird are very light, so that the bird might fly with a minimum of effort. The atomic particles that have combined to produce stones and earth are heavier, that they might be used by nature to support trees, etc. It is not the density of the atoms that matters, it is the degree of attractive force, the power contained within each atom that varies. And it is that which provides the concept of mass or weight. Understanding of that relatively simple point will enable us to take the next step and begin to examine the larger, more far-reaching concept of how the law of mutual attraction acts within the life force, bringing together that which the life force requires in order to manifest itself on any plane and in any degree. Let us suppose that, once again, we examine our friend, the daffodil. This plant is chosen purely at random. Any other plant, mineral or animal, would have provided enlightenment in the same degree. However, we have observed in an earlier chapter that the plant springs into growth, matures, flowers, declines and apparently dies, although it is merely dormant. We have studied why this process is vital to the ongoingness of all life and it was appreciated that the battle between the forces of growth and the forces of decay perform a vital function. Mention was made of the archangelic forces who manipulate for good the essential life force, the logos of that plant, in order to permit the species to evolve successfully in an ever-changing climate. From that basis, we will consider the nature of the force that draws matter, in all levels applicable to the plant, together to, to manufacture a daffodil as distinct from a rose or a thorn bush. We are accustomed to observe within the structure of any living thing a series of molecules termed DNA and RNA. We are informed that they are basically sugar in content and form the building blocks, the blueprint for that plant. We nod our heads sagely and turn away just as mystified to comprehend how, if the DNA of one plant appears basically identical to that of another, how then does the plant know that it is a daffodil or a rose or, indeed, a horse or a human? We will not find the answer by examining the molecules observable in a physical realm. That which is observed is merely the end product of a complex interplay of forces manipulated by those archangels who control the nature of all life. The real action is taking place in areas far removed from the aegis of the naked eye. We therefore begin at the highest point in the construction of a daffodil. It is decided that there is a need to construct such a plant. And so, from the bank of life force, a life essence is selected and endowed with the necessary qualities that will set it forever to being a daffodil. The nature of that force, which gives undifferentiated life force a certain quality, as was mentioned before, cannot be successfully described. 
We ask you to accept that it exists. Once that life force has been endowed with the qualities needed to enable it to become a daffodil, then it begins a long journey downwards in terms of vibration towards the earth. The essential life force does not alter in vibration, but as it descends, it draws round itself an aura of fine matter that is essential to permit it to identify with the plane that it is destined to land upon. However, the question is, of course, what is the attractive force that causes matter to be drawn round the life force? This is the point that language begins to fail us. We have asked you to accept once the nature of a force that causes life force to become differentiated into any particular area, and we do not wish to presume upon your credibility by asking you to accept more and more mysteries. We therefore will attempt by analogy, to explain how a life force attracts particular forms of matter to itself, leaving all other alone. Mention was made earlier of colours of the rainbow, of white light being split up into an infinite variety of tones and hues. We also spoke of the force of gravity being split into different levels of vibration, resulting in one object being of greater mass than another. We carry on with the concept of layers, of levels, into which something can be split, ranging in whatever type of force is necessary, from little to great. By the same token, the living force enwrapped around any living object is endowed with the ability to attract only the vibrations of a particular bandwidth. Thus, we wish to present to you the concept that the life force destined to become a daffodil is charged with a force by the archangels that causes matter of a particular vibration to be attracted to it, and that matter is necessary to the total creation of a daffodil. It is exclusively used for a daffodil and will remain in suspension despite all else that is made awaiting the creation of daffodils. Therefore, we hope that you can appreciate that the simple yet marvellous life force within its coating called a soul is endowed with a force that not only tells it that it is destined to become a daffodil, but sends out a signal at, initially, the highest level that alerts the mass of etheric matter floating aimlessly that it requires a certain amount at a particular vibration to be drawn to it. Thus, it assumes its first aura. It must be appreciated that that description, though in essence true and graphic, is nevertheless a poor description of the reality. The beauty of creation will have to be experienced by the individual once he reaches a high enough level of advancement. Words cannot describe the creation of life any more than they can describe a sunset. We ask that you accept as a working hypothesis these words until you can prove for yourself the reality of creation. The life force that we may now call an embryo daffodil, slowly descends through the planes of ever denser matter until it is able to merge with the parent body of the plant in the earth and a new bulb is born which will grow slowly until it is mature enough to flower and to contribute to the cycle of energy that flows in a rotating manner, enabling all life to progress. Those who have followed the discussion so far will no doubt be curious to discover how the concept that applies to a daffodil relates to humans. Most of the events that occur in God's kingdom, called nature, are basically similar in that what applies to one piece of basic God force in a particular circumstance applies to all. 
Therefore, it may be assumed that all life forms that were and are destined to be part of the earth would follow the pattern of creation that was described earlier. The life forms of the earth would include all minerals, all atoms that create air and water, all vegetation and all animal life. The sole remaining inhabitants of the earth that do not fit into that pattern are humans. As has been mentioned earlier, humans are visitors to the planet earth and their true home is in the spiritual planes. Therefore, the path that they follow to be born to incarnate is slightly different to that of the earth forms. In essence, the process is similar in that the differentiated life force with its soul coating would draw round it matter that would enable it to land on any of the planes of auric vibration and so finally to be born on earth. But there are a number of variations. First and most important, it should be noted that unlike the earth forms, human embryo souls do not necessarily incarnate on earth. There are many areas for humans to explore and to grow in stature and the earth is only one of them. Many young souls feel the need to incarnate into gross matter but not all. It is quite possible to bypass the earthly incarnation stage. Do not believe the fall from grace story in the Bible. It is a misconception of why people incarnate on earth. Some, indeed vast numbers of embryo spiritual beings, have a propensity for good and so are not attracted to the earth. Others, for whatever reason, sense within themselves that they are not naturally pure. This may seem strange to imagine that some souls are naturally pure and some are not, but look around you. There are many men and women who lead decent lives and there are some who seek every kind of degradation. Therefore, accept the veracity of the information given. Those individuals who sense that they are not naturally perfect would automatically, through the law of mutual attraction, be drawn to a particular area for growth. In your case, and ours, it was the planet Earth. It could have been one of many other planets. Mars is an example. Scientists in their rocket ships have photographed Mars and have observed nothing. Unfortunately for them, they have been looking at the physical surface. Had they the ability to observe with auric vision, they would observe a great deal of activity and much of it unpleasant. However, we will assume that we feel attracted to Earth. We descend through the planes of ever denser matter until we arrive at a final staging post one of twelve, because remember that we travel along a ray that we call a sign of the zodiac. At that staging post, we rest. We have now round us not only our spirit of God within its soul, not only seven auras, albeit rather limp, being totally lacking in power, but also we now have an etheric double, a coating, the exact replica of the human figure. During the resting period, we wait until we feel drawn by the same law of mutual attraction to a particular country, to a particular class and colour of people. We wait until a suitable couple conceive a child. That child does not contain a soul at that point, nor a spirit of God. It is an extension of and dependent upon its mother. It will contain within its genes certain characteristics of both parents, which will, to a certain extent, form its body and facial characteristics, but its personality will be that of the incarnating individual.
If that were not so, and the baby merely responded to the genetic influence of the parents, all babies of any particular parents would be born identical, and all would have the same personality. This is clearly not so except in the case of split eggs forming identical twins, even then they have their own individual personalities. As the baby grows within the womb, the incarnating individual draws closer and closer until he is able to merge partly with the baby. However, he does not take complete control until the baby is born. At the moment of birth, the soul and etheric body enwrap themselves round that baby and it springs to life. Doctors think that by slapping the baby to force it to cry, it effects that process. But although it opens the baby's lungs, it is the merging of spirit, soul and etheric double that causes the baby to become alive. There are cases where the body of the baby is faulty, in which case the spirit, etc., withdraws and the baby dies. But in most cases, the baby is successfully brought into the world. However, the auras do not all merge at once. To do so, the power required to pour energy in and out of the body would be too great, and so the baby initially lies in its cradle with a body, an etheric double, a soul, and a spirit. Gradually over the years, the auras merge one by one, typically every seven years. Therefore, the infant is relatively mature in years before it has all its auras, and therefore it is not possible to be a complete human with all the attributes, including wisdom, etc., until one is middle-aged. You cannot indeed put an old head on young shoulders. It is futile to attempt to do so. In the old days... The youth did the hard work of the tribe and gathered the food, whilst the elders sat in council deliberating and formulating policy. This process followed natural events and was correct. Nowadays, it is customary to promote energetic youth into positions of power and authority. It is a mistake because they do not have the auras around them to allow them to make wise decision. The result is all around you and the chaos will remain until you relegate the youth to do jobs requiring strength and vitality and leave policy making to the elders. Those that allow themselves to come to terms with the need for change within their society will appreciate that it is necessary to follow the precepts of faith, love and charity in order to realize oneness with God. There is no room for ego to manifest itself and there is no place for power struggle. Those concepts will drive men ultimately to despair because should one carry those emotions along with one for sufficient time, they will create such disharmony within one that will cause great unhappiness. They must be got rid of and as soon as possible and then the auras may begin to quicken in vibration to fill with energy and will alter the character of the individual. We state the above to indicate that, once again, man differs from the plant and animal kingdom. The auras of plants and animals are not capable of expansion or contraction in terms of vibrancy because plants and animals are incapable of many of the higher and indeed lower emotions. The creatures of the earth have a set of emotions that is applicable to them and are, in fact, alien to mankind, although man loves to give human attributes to animals. Fear is shared with the animal kingdom, but that is learned from animals. Animals feel pain, heat and cold. 
They feel affection on a par with many humans, but that is but a poor reflection of the true emotion that can be experienced. All other feelings are applicable only to them. Plants are even more limited and soil, etc., yet more so. It is, therefore, that the auras of those earth beings do not expand greatly. Thus, they contribute little to the overall power available within the universe. However, that is the limit of their capabilities. Man should be capable of much higher, more powerful emotions and should be capable of filling the auras to a much greater extent. The overall effect upon the universe is therefore much greater. However, many, indeed most, do not fulfill their potential. They spend their lives in useless pursuits and contribute little to themselves or to the total stock of universal power. It should not be so. Indeed, one of the reasons why man incarnates on earth is to fulfill the quota of spiritual energy being emanated from the planet into the spiritual realms. By not doing so, man is therefore permitting an increasing deficit to be built up which contributes to the negative forces holding sway over the earth. People often argue that conditions generally are worse today than they were years ago. It is true. It is because the spiritual deficit is ever increasing. Therefore, life will become more and more chaotic until those who can begin to pray, to meditate and to serve God. Their auras will expand. The flow of spiritual energy will increase and man will become at peace with himself and with all life around him. All life will respond to the positive forces being given out and the troubles will begin to lessen. We will now look at an area that will give insight into the mechanisms at work behind the concept of movement towards perfection in relation to the law of mutual attraction and how it works drawing us into areas of opportunity and bringing guides and teachers into our compass. We know, either from experience or by having read, that as we turn towards God in a positive and creative manner, we need to pray, meditate and to serve God manifest in all life. We know also that it is necessary, indeed inevitable, that our auras will expand, filled with spiritual power, and that, sooner or later, we will be actively guided by a teacher who may be alive and on earth, or may be alive and in the spiritual realms. That teacher will be usually the only contact that the student will have to those enlightened beings, but the teacher himself will have an even more enlightened one who will be guiding him, and so on in a chain. Thus it is that all pull together towards perfection, and that also the message remains pure as each student in turn receives information and passes it unmodified to someone who depends upon him for guidance. That chain of linked beings does not come about by accident. There is a force at work, mutual attraction, which ensures that like attracts like. By that law will one spiritual person be drawn to another. However, that chain will only continue to be forged as long as each member of the chain acts in a correct manner. Should one of the links become weak, then the chain will be broken. 
Should that happen, then, of course, it is necessary to find another individual with whom the chain can work, for the desire is ultimately for all mankind to be linked into one unit, all working for God, and until and unless the members of the original group all work to their utmost, then nothing can be achieved. All are dependent upon each other. Any one person may break the chain, and that impedes the progress of all. Such a state is not permitted to continue for very long. Those beings whom we call enlightened are compassionate. They understand all the problems to which mankind is heir. They have in their time experienced and suffered those problems. Therefore, they will allow time for any individual to overcome problems. They concentrate all their vision upon the work of God and will allow nothing to impede that progress. The student should take notice then that he is welcome to join the chain of spiritual beings. He will be used to further God's power on earth. As he grows in spirituality, he will be used more and more. He will, too, be used as a teacher to someone less enlightened than himself. By that method, and through the experience that he gains by serving God, he will become a greater, more powerful link in the chain. But, should he falter, grow tired or disinterested in the work, he will be dropped by the group once all attempts to help him have failed. Once abandoned, he will find it difficult to resume his place on the team as the trust placed in him by his peers would have been broken. Therefore, let the student act in a calm and positive fashion, not taking on more work for the spirit than he can maintain. The work will continue for the rest of his existence and should be viewed in that light. The story of the tortoise and the hare is an appropriate illustration of the thoughts we have on that subject. It is very easy initially when the gift of the spirit first appear and one realizes that he is able to assist people in a positive and much sought after manner but it is too a temptation to undertake too great a commitment in terms of time and effort disappointment is bound to follow which will cause disillusionment to the individual concerned and will reduce confidence by the public in the credibility of the spiritual concepts being portrayed. People look to their leaders for example. A leader must, therefore, not be weak. It is unacceptable to the public for a person to preach one thing and to do another. Consistency is vital to the ongoingness of the White Brotherhood and, should you wish to join, you will be required to act in a consistent manner yourself, not for just a few months or a few years, but for the rest of your time on earth and for all of your long residence in the spiritual realms. Further, you will be expected to improve and grow more powerful over the years as you take on an ever-widening band of pupils that will be drawn to you by the law of mutual attraction. You must not fail them. Therefore, through prayer and meditation, you will come to realize the area of service that you will use in order to serve the God made manifest in man, and... As you advance, so you will be expected to expand your horizons to include more people and a greater diversity of disciplines. Work slowly. Work thoroughly. Allow yourself time. You have all of eternity before you. Allow your spirituality to grow and in the same degree your ability to cope with spiritual work will grow. 
follow the precepts, the advice given in the chapter concerning the manner in which to conduct oneself for health and for vitality, and in peace become at one with us. You are welcome and are sorely needed. Never feel isolated or alone. We are always close to you, unseen and perhaps unfelt, but we are there, ever guiding, ever carrying you on wings of light, as we too are carried by those eagles who are above us. In turn, you will learn to fly and will carry someone to salvation. Let nothing and no one dismay you or turn you from the path. The chain of spiritual beings that you join will become a mighty armour enshrouding all the world, defending the just from the invading forces of Satan. Your link is as vital a part of that armour as the greatest forged by the highest and most powerful being in heaven. All is one. You and he are one. Do not forget that. You and Jesus are one and the same. He is in you, a part of you, and you are part of him. Just as you would welcome Jesus into your life, ensure that you live and act in a manner that Jesus too would welcome as part of himself. You will be making great strides for yourself and for all mankind by so doing. We now come to a discussion of the methodology of a return to simplicity and to discuss why life is so complicated for so many. If we consider primitive man who lived not only long ago but still lives in remote regions of the world, we find that society surprisingly complex. One would imagine that such people would fill their lives with the needs for shelter, food and procreation as do animals and have little interest in anything else. But such is not the case. We find upon study that there is a complex infrastructure of social interreaction of religion and superstition, a clear hierarchical order and so on. We study such people and marvel at the complexity of their lives, of their ritual and dance patterns, and of their habits regarding gender, food, taboos, etc. Yet, we seldom bother to inquire why this complicated and apparently unnecessary to our eyes order came about. It seems very important to the people concerned and occupies a great deal of time and yet contributes little to survival of the individual. If we, civilised, were to be placed in their environment, we would be fully occupied merely in survival with no time and certainly no concern for the extraneous events which are so important to primitive man. Therefore, we will investigate why these strange patterns of behaviour are there and how they originated. It will provide insight into our behaviour in so-called civilization. The first aspect which needs to be understood is that mankind is not indigenous to earth, as are animals. As has been mentioned earlier, we use the planet Earth to gain experience and to assist the Earth in generating spiritual energy. Therefore, when we first arrived here many millions of years ago, it was not only food and shelter that occupied our minds, but we had a memory of those areas in which we had dwelled before incarnating on Earth. In those areas, we do not have physical bodies, and therefore we do not require food or shelter, nor do we procreate. Therefore, unless something else occupied our minds, we would live in a mental vacuum. Such, of course, is not the case. 
We would be fairly simple creatures at that point in our development, and concepts of God, prayer, and service would be unknown. But, nevertheless, there is the memory that we were created by God, and that through our descent, through the spheres, we observed, albeit darkly, great beings, planes of beauty, and wondrous worlds. Therefore, it would be natural that, simple and unable to comprehend as we might be, our thoughts should turn to those worlds, and that we should try to reach out with our minds and imaginations into those realms. Such is not possible at the time to achieve with success, but there is the need and desire to try. By the law of mutual attraction, the emotions surrounding those areas are drawn to those who reach out, and so the imagination is fed with the concepts mentioned above. Although the creatures, human but very basic and simple, try to fit these imagined concepts into a cohesive pattern, they are not able so to do, and thus they are obliged to formulate ritual in order to express those imagined events. With time, the ritual becomes formalized into patterns of behavior which fulfill a need and to which all are desired to conform. The ritual begins to assume an importance of its own and finally becomes settled into a pattern of behavior, a form of civilization which is justified on grounds that it is the obvious and normal fashion of behavior. When man incarnated to earth, he had, of course, the problem of shelter, food and procreation to deal with. Once that was overcome, he was able to look round to see if there was anything else to occupy his mind. The memories of his previous existence came flooding back, and he was soon immersed with forming on earth a civilization similar to that which was complied with in his spiritual realm. It was modified, of course, to take account of his earth environment, but followed similar lines. Thus came into being the strange rituals that we see today. If we look closely, we can observe that at the nub of all belief is a belief in a deity, and that there are usually gods that are known that control the environment and who must be placated and encouraged through sacrifice and dance. One can observe immediately the parallel between the reality of a creating deity and the directors of life who control the earth and all that is, though they act automatically and do not need bribing. Also, there is usually amongst primitive man a concept of evil, of a dark force, a devil, and there are taboo areas. Once again, we know that there are indeed dark forces and that hell is very real. Thus, we can observe a likeness to reality in primitive man's ritual and begin to comprehend that he performs it because the information is fed into his imagination by the law of mutual attraction from the experiences glimpsed long before. It is the fact that it becomes stylized into formal routines that will lead us into the modern world, for there we observe that we still act in fashions that do not really stand up under open criticism, that we have strange, unreal concepts of God, saints, and of angelic forces. We, of course, through our increased intelligence and ability to manipulate concepts, have stylized and formalized these events into acceptability, 
But when you go into a church, when you see the priests in their finery, the choir dressed in flowing gowns of white, etc., ask yourself, where did the ideas come from? Certainly not Jesus, nor from any other prophet. They lived and worked in whatever clothes they had on. They had no temples dripping with gold and jewels, no. The memory comes down from those ancestral events experienced as we came down by the law of mutual attraction. We saw beautiful things, we observed godlike creatures, and we feel the need to recreate them in our attempt to climb back up the spheres to the plains of beauty. However, that is not the way. You cannot dress up as a king and by so doing become a king. You cannot wear the apparel of an angel and become one by so doing. And you cannot assume the mantle of perfection and arrive at that state. It is imagination. It is childish. When you were children, you played with toys. If you wish to become a man, put away your childish things and act like a man. You do not need the churches, the priests, and all the finery that exists. Sell it all and give to the poor. Follow Jesus, and through the trinity of prayer, meditation, and devotion to God, you will rise to be at one with the reality that is. Reality is far more rewarding than imagination. Wear the apparel of simplicity and truth, and you will one day wear the garments of a god. Keep your faith simple. Avoid ritual, gestures, and mumbo-jumbo. The primitive being in a jungle has no means of transcending it, but you have. Those who dress up in cloth of gold, those who recite ritualistically, prayers, and perform ceremonies as if to appease the gods waste their time. Do not let them waste yours. Your work is too important. Your world is in reality. Live not in the world of illusion, but climb the stairway to truth, freedom, and genuine experience. Your reward will be great and will have the ring of truth. You will not finish your life disillusioned and empty like so many who devote their lives, no matter how honestly, to chasing shadows. You cannot catch a shadow. You cannot experience imagined events. Therefore, do not try. The truth is solid, real, and is within your grasp. Seize it with both hands and cling to it for the rest of your existence. You will be blessed and, in turn, by showing others the way, you will again be blessed. That is the way the law of mutual attraction works, bringing illusions to those who seek illusion and bringing truth to those who seek truth. Choose for yourself.